The following presentation is a gift from the team at Streamline Publishing, publishers of Fine Art Connoisseur, Plain Air Magazine, and weekly newsletters Fine Art Today, Realism Today, Plain Air Today, and American Watercolor, and events, the Plain Air Convention and the Figurative Art Convention. We offer over 400 different art instruction tutorials in ultra high quality video by the world's leading artists. If you like what you see, help us support our artists and our team with your purchase. Each video aired has a special discount code for today only in the comments section with a link to the video offered. And to see everything we do, or if you want to receive notice of new releases, new products, and new events for artists, simply click the other link, which says, see everything we do. Thank you. Hi, I'm Eric Rhodes, publisher of Fine Art Connoisseur and Plen Air Magazine. Today we've got a great still life video from Jeff Legg. It's called Cobalt and Cantaloupe. Hi, my name is Jeff Legg, and I'm here this morning to talk to you about still life. Uh, it's been my passion for about the past 20 years, and uh, we're going to be painting this setup here today, and uh, hopefully I can step you through some of my thought process in uh, uh, working through this painting and problem solving. We're going to talk about the visual elements. We're going to talk about uh, just the materials I use, some of the techniques and uh, hopefully just get you excited about the, uh, the idea of painting still life with all its endless possibilities of color, texture, composition, and uh, uh, the many ways of looking and thinking about painting light. Here's the palette of colors I'm going to use today. Lizarin Crimson, Cadmium Red Deep, Cadmium Red Medium, Cadmium Orange, Cad Yellow Medium, Cad Yellow Light, Cadmium Lemon, Naples Yellow, Yellow Ochre, Sap Green, Viridian, Cobalt Blue, Ultramarine Blue, Transparent Red Oxide, Romber, Ivory Black, Flake White, and this is Mirage Medium. Uh, now I'd like to talk to you about the uh, surface I'm working on today, which is a uh, 1 8 inch masonite panel that's been pre-gessoed and then toned with romber and a little bit of cobalt blue to cool the mixture. And it's just simply applied with uh, a brush and a, maybe uh, a rag uh, to give it more of an uneven surface. Uh, many times in my work, the background will show through in places, and that just lends itself to a little bit more interesting painting. Uh, also, I should talk about the, the smoothness of the board. It's uh, very important to uh, the luminosity of the paint that the board is not too rough. The uh, paint, uh, well, the light shines through the paint, and bounces off the smoother surface, giving the, the paint a little bit more luminosity. And uh, also the smoothness of the board, although it's not very forgiving, it does show every brush stroke. Um, it, do, it will take a little more practice to, uh, to master working on a smooth surface, but the beauty of it is that uh, your brush strokes are there for uh, the texture and directional uh, gesture and uh, you can just build up some wonderful uh, surface texture on a smooth surface like this. Um, I'd also like to talk about uh, brushes today. And uh, I use mainly hog filberts, uh, bristle filberts, and uh, from various sizes. Um, and I, I, I paint mainly with the filberts, but I also have a few uh, synthetic sables in here, uh, which are uh, nice to have. 
Um, the synthetics are easy to clean. They don't wear out as fast as real sables, so I don't even bother with real sables anymore. I, I'd wear them out so quickly. Uh, I've got a fan brush here, which is nice for breaking some edges. Um, I've got a small <coughs> round uh, soft brush here for some detail work and some smaller uh, filberts, uh, both uh, the synthetic sable and the bristle, um, as well as uh, a nice wide synthetic sable here, which is nice for, for breaking down or knocking down a background or smoothing out uh, areas in the painting, and a painting knife here, which is well used and very flexible. Some of the principles uh, in painting I wanted to talk about are uh, what I call the six visual elements of painting, um, starting with composition and then color, value, drawing, and edges, and then as well as surface. Um, when we refer to composition, we're talking about, well, all of these visual elements, I might add, are, uh, are all about relationships. And the uh, composition is um, placement relationships. And it's just basically determining the location of all the, uh, the essential uh, subjects in your painting and how they're arranged. And I like to think about composition uh, much in the same <coughs> vein as music. Um, composition has rhythm, movement, and harmony. And so these are the things that I strive for uh, when setting up a still life. Uh, in a nutshell, uh, just make it interesting. Make it uh, visually interesting to look at. Uh, repetitious, but also interesting at the same time. You have the rhythm, you have the movement, how your eye moves through the painting, and the harmony of everything, the uh, similar items, uh, uh, mixed with other uh, shapes that are maybe not so similar. So you just want to keep, keep the painting interesting and harmonious and uh, moving the eye. Um, color is uh, the next element that uh, uh, is all, all important, of course. Um, color can only have uh, three properties, value, hue, and intensity. And these are all relationship, relationships again. They're uh, uh, related to each other. Uh, color is very relative. Um, colors can look different just depending on what other color is next to, to it. Um, so when we talk about intensity, it's how bright or how dull the color is. When we talk about uh, value, it's how light or how dark. Uh, when we talk about hue, that's simply the actual color, whether it's green, red, yellow, or whatever. The uh, next element is value, and uh, this is all about light and dark relationships. And uh, when I teach workshops, it's value that I have to keep uh, uh, pushing that people understand values. If you have your values right, it uh, virtually uh, is irrelevant what colors you use. Uh, so you must really concentrate on values and getting those relationships of lights and darks uh, in your painting uh, correct. And uh, then we move on to drawing. Uh, drawing is simply about size and shape relationships. Uh, how tall, how wide, the uh, any given uh, uh, dimension of a vase or whatever we're dealing with here, uh, the relationships of, uh, of width and height and uh, distance from, from one another. Uh, then we move on to edges. Uh, edges are all about the relationships of soft and hard. Edges can be soft, they can be lost, they can be hard, or uh, anywhere in between. And how you handle edges in a painting uh, will greatly determine how the eye travels through the painting and what you compel the viewer to look at. And lastly is uh, 
surface and the surface quality of your painting is uh, the relationship of uh, transparent to opaque and uh, rough to smooth and uh, these relationships are important. Uh, textures uh, tend to, to draw the eye, whereas uh, more transparent, quiet areas of paint uh, tend to recede. And so you can use that to your, your advantage. The concept is uh, all important in your painting. And uh, concept is just another word for idea. You've got to have a strong idea for uh, your painting before you start it. Uh, why do you want to paint this painting? Uh, what do you want to say in this painting? What, uh, what's your idea? Uh, is it about color? Is it about texture? Is it about uh, rhythm? Is it about the light? Is it about mystery? There's an uh, infinite number of ways to think about your concept, but the important thing is, is that you have a concept. Um, why do you want to paint this? What caused you to come up with these ideas for your painting? Uh, do you really want to paint this? Is, it, uh, is the prospect of painting it uh, exciting to you? And uh, if the answer is no to any of those, um, you might want to uh, back up and really think about uh, what you want to paint and, and just really get excited about the painting. Um, my process starts with a thumbnail sketch. and. Uh, this is not really a thumbnail, but I needed to make it large enough for this video. And um, I start with uh, an idea in my mind for uh, the painting, a concept. Uh, in this case, I, I knew that I wanted to use a cobalt cup that I've painted many times before and uh, contrast it with the beautiful orange of a cantaloupe slice. And um, so I worked up this sketch, um, basically just simple shapes uh, of values and some leaves. Um, just the very essential elements are put into the sketch and it's just done from my head. Uh, normally I'd, I would do it maybe two inches square, just a little thumbnail sketch. Um, Again, for the purpose of this video, I've made it large enough for, for you to see here. But um, So once I have the thumbnail sketch done, then I can begin setting up the actual still life. And uh, we have here the uh, rose petal, which is in balance to the other uh, roses in the painting. And the idea here is for the leaves to lead you into the painting. And as you can see, the leaves even get more red, more similar to the color of the cantaloupe as they come in. And then you've got the nice contrast of the grapes against the orange and uh, the sweep of the melon up to the, the rose. Uh, you'll have this intense cobalt uh, color which will uh, be very luminous and, and will hold you in the painting. It'll be very compelling. And then hopefully your eye will circulate back up to the leaves and uh, back down and through the painting again. So basically you want the viewer to be able to continue to look through the painting, uh, always keeping it interesting, but not want to leave the painting. All right, let's get this painting started here. Um, as we're uh, getting going here, I uh, want to talk a little bit about the Merge medium, which is uh, a basically a medium that helps speed the drying time of the paint. Uh, depends a little bit on the batch of Merge that you get and also the uh, weather conditions, uh, if it's humid or dry out. But as a general rule, the paint should start to dry probably in about uh, uh, three hours, four hours. Uh, it'll start setting up, uh, which will allow me to come back the second day and uh, do some glazing, which uh, I'd like to show you 
a bit of. Um, now, to start the painting, um, I'm going to take a little bit of Merge and just spread a little bit on the, the surface so that I'm not painting on just a dry surface. Um, this will do two things. It will help the paint to adhere to this slick surface uh, a little better. And it will also uh, allow my brush to slide a little bit smoother and easier across the surface so I can get nicer uh, brush strokes. So just a very light coat, not too thick at all, just, uh, just enough to get it wet. Um, one thing that you really want to do, try to do, uh, before you start your painting, and I'll even uh, just sit in a quiet room and, and do this, I'll try to visualize this setup as a painting. And uh, we all had imaginations when we were kids, and we they tend to they go away as we get older, but if you can exercise your ability to visualize uh, what you're seeing and what what uh, what this is going to look like as a painting, and uh, virtually step through everything, see yourself painting this, uh, the different passages. Try to work through the uh, maybe some of the more difficult areas that you you find confusing, <clears throat> and have those worked out before um, you start or at least try to work them out. There's always surprises, so um, you can't work out everything, but you can, you can certainly kind of give yourself a little bit of a road map. Uh, so here I'm starting with some just raw umber and black and a little bit of merge medium. And uh, I'll begin just massing in the simplest uh, shapes and, uh, and as I mass this in, uh, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to find what, what are my boundaries. You know, I'm, I'm seeing visually that the painting on the right side is here, and it's probably going to end maybe over here about halfway through this leaf. So if I uh, determine that my my right side boundary where this cobalt cup, let's say it's uh, approximately right there and this grape is about right there. And I come over to the left side and this rose is about here and the leaf is about there. So since I've marked the outer edges of what my boundaries are, I kind of can more easily determine how to fit everything in. Uh, and so now I'll just start um, with not too much paint, just uh, uh, a light bit of raw umber and black. I begin to determine that's, that's going to be my cup. And maybe I'll just raise that up just a little bit more. Make it a little bit higher, about right there. And then the tabletop will be right through here. That's this front edge. And then So this is my, my cobalt cup and my cantaloupe. They're the, the star of the show, so to speak. So um, I'm going to go right in and just block those, those shapes in. So that sweeps into the 
cobalt cup. And then we've got a cast shadow from the, uh, the melon. And then you got these grape shapes. Again, when I'm describing the objects, saying grapes, cantaloupe, melon, <clears throat> you don't want to think about uh, what these things are other than shapes and colors. Um, you really got to put yourself in the mind of, of an artist and think in terms of more abstract uh, ideas. You're not painting a cantaloupe and a cup, you're just painting a orange shape and a blue shape. Um, and this shape of the rose here. And this leaf shape coming up through here. And then I see a cast shadow coming through here which is from this other leaf. And then this is the mass of grapes here. And this is that rose. So you might just catch the edge of that, that green leaf over on this side. It may not quite make it into the painting. One thing you can do as an artist, too, um, is that we're not just here to copy what we see, but we're trying to actually create something of beauty. And we have the freedom as artists to edit and move things around as necessary. And uh, just take the, the initiative. And, and if you want, for instance, if I wanted that leaf in there, I can move it over to the right if I'd like, if I think it'll make the painting better. So here's the shape of this leaf back there, and this leaf back here, which I, I can barely see a little bit of light on it, and I really want to take that uh, advantage of that light hitting that leaf, because I think it'll help balance this composition. So keep that in mind. Now, uh, we have this leaf here, and then this leaf here, which I've actually sort of strategically placed, and I've taped these two leaves together with some masking tape because I wanted that leaf to be turned in order to, I can, if you look at the right angle, you can see the orange from the melon reflecting up into that leaf which is just beautiful. And uh, so that's why I did that. There's that leaf there. And this leaf here. And another one up here. And then I see a leaf shape back here, and another one back here. As the, uh, since this is the primary focal point in the painting, um, and these other elements are secondary, and when, once you get out to these edges, including the background and some of these leaves, it becomes very uh, just tertiary. And there's sort of a hierarchy of, uh, of subject in your, in your painting. 
and you want to keep that in mind. It's like you're setting a stage and you've got your star players and you've got um, your supporting cast and then you've got all your set and props and kind of the tertiary things uh, as well. You know, I, this, the, the thing that the, paint, the setup is sitting on, this block of wood and everything, it's not very pretty, so I'm going to just sort of embellish that a little bit and uh, uh, create my own tabletop here. Um, so that's, again, just taking the initiative as an artist and, and making it more than it, uh, it really is. So I, I think maybe I'll include a couple of these leaf shapes back here. Uh, I think they add some interest. Again, I'm not being real specific. I'm trying to be accurate in my placement, but I'm not... Um, you know, being a slave to detail right now, I'm just uh, just trying to get some some real basic shapes in the leaf shape here. And this leaf hangs over the table. You get this really nice shadow. And I got a couple shadows hanging over the edge of the table here. So I'm, I'm another thing uh, I haven't talked about either is squinting. And in order to clearly see uh, your values without letting the detail get um, too involved is uh, squinting. It's just an absolutely essential part of painting. So I'm squinting at my setup. I'm not squinting at my, my painting, of course, but I squint at my set, setup and I can more clearly uh, it reduces the detail and, and it simplifies the value shapes, so I'm able to uh, more readily see the just the essential values in this painting. And, uh, and then we got a little bit. See, this is a mass of grapes right in here, and then this rose. Got a little bit of a shadow overhang there and another one here. And so when I set this up, I wanted to make sure that there was a nice spacing of these shadows, that they weren't all evenly spaced. They're not equal distance apart. They're, they have a rhythm to it, uh, much like music. It's not just, you know, even all the way. It's a repetition, but it also is... Uh, uh, an interesting repetition. I'm going to kind of cut in around some of this, uh, some of these shapes. So 
So this, that leaf is a light object against this dark background. Again, this is all just the very initial lay-in. And it's all, you know, monochromatic. No color yet at this point. Another kind of element of, of my work um, that people seem to like and I like is the aspect of the sort of the unfinished areas. Um, not really, it's not that they're really unfinished, but it's more left uh, in, a, in a vignette sort of a look. Um, so some of these tertiary parts of the painting um, I'll oftentimes leave them very loose and open I'm kind of losing sight of some of my uh, leaf shapes here. I'm going to just kind of wipe this brush dry and pull off some of this paint so I can see what I'm doing. I'm kind of losing uh, this shape here, this leaf. I can even just, if I need to, Go in here and, and rub it off with my paper towel. That leaf. So, you know, a lot of this business of painting is uh, sort of a series of correcting mistakes. And so, as I block this in, you know, I get a little bit closer to what I'm seeing. May not always be exactly right the first time, but The neat thing about oil is that you can make changes very easily. On that leaf is right in there. Okay. You know, so that I don't have uh, a lot of uh, unsightly ridges of paint here in the tertiary area, I'm taking my soft brush and I'm just going to kind of knock down everything so that any, on the smooth surface like this, it's... Uh, very easy to have ridges of thick paint where you really don't want ridges of thick paint in the background. Are you using heavy pressure or light pressure with that brush? Uh, medium. 
<laughs> it doesn't take it doesn't take much to knock the uh, knock it down. I don't like the way that goes all the way up, so I'm going to just take some of that out. Again, I'm I'm you know I'm pre-planning the background. I want that to have a certain look. Certain openness. In a certain uh, beauty to the even the outer edges of the painting. I'm thinking about at this point. Again, this is all very thinly painted. So once I uh, start adding color. Um, there's going to be very little of this romber and black that will uh, become part of the paint or contaminate the, uh, the, the color that I put on top. But, uh, and also that's one factor there is, is just how, how you apply the color and, and uh, you know, how much paint you use. How you how well you can cover over this this lay in, and that you know is really just takes kind of experience in doing it. So going to make sure that you have a good idea where that melon is be right in here I'm not even going to bother with those grapes hanging over the melon at this point because the uh, the melon slice is going to have to be painted first, and then I'll probably paint right into the uh, paint those grapes right over that, right over the melon. I think I'll pull a little bit of leaf, more leaf shape out. Because I really want to keep in mind that these le leaves help lead the eye into the, your eye into the painting. Um, and then this one. It's a little bit bigger. And then That one that we're going to see the reflected light underneath it. Okay, now that I think I've got the basic uh, lay-in in place, I'm going, going to uh, kind of decide on the background and get it uh, started. 
and I'm going to take some merge and some black. And we're dealing with a very neutral green background. And I think I'm going to make sure I mix up enough of this because I don't want to have to remix it um, if I run out. So I'm going to take some yellow ochre. And start with my darkest dark for my background, which is a very kind of an olive, dark olive green with a yellow ochre and ivory black makes a very beautiful green. And I think I'll take a little bit of that, leave a pile of the dark, and then I'm going to mix up a pile that is a little bit lighter in value. Looks like I'm going to need some more merge. We'll get that squeezed out. Uh, for those of you who have never used Merge or wonder where you get it, you can uh, go to my website, jeffleg.com, and I have my uh, complete material list under my workshops uh, heading and it tells you where you can get Merge medium. I'm mix a little bit of white in this mixture. A little bit more. A little bit more yellow ochre. So I'm just trying to get a little bit lighter version of that same color. And just hold it up to the painting and see kind of where I'm at color wise. That's about right for the the second color and then I'm going to take part of this pile and mix up the lightest version of the background. So I'll add a little bit more white to that, a little bit more yellow ochre. A little bit of merge in there so that it will dry by tomorrow, hopefully. A little more white. Mm, let me look at that up there. Yeah, that's about right. And I might have to modify these values just a bit once I get started applying it to the painting, but uh, I think for now these are fairly close. And um, I'm also going to mix up a color for the melon. Well, actually, it's going to be the air behind the melon. And uh, in order for your painting to, to seem like it has air in it, you've got to uh, paint the air. You've got to paint the atmosphere around your objects. And uh, some people call it the halo or the glow. 
But in fact, in reality, what happens, and uh, it's a very subtle thing, but um, your eye actually sees the, the light bouncing off of an object and uh, back up into the air around the object. You can re more readily see this in a situation where there's smoke or heavy humidity in the air. Just look at a street light at night and you can see the glow around that light. Um, well, the same thing basically happens when light strikes an object. It bounces off that object and uh, back into the atmosphere around the object. So it, it essentially makes the atmosphere have a little bit of that color, a little bit of that light around the object. And again, you can't overemphasize or overdo that because it'll look uh, rather contrived, but if you uh, are subtle about it, it can be very uh, helpful in convincing you that there's air around whatever, whatever you're painting. Um, so that would be I think the air around the melon and then uh, <clears throat> then we have the rose. So I'm going to take a little bit of alizarin and uh, a little bit of white. And we'll use this for the air around the rose. A little bit more merge. So I'm just trying to get these in the kind of the ballpark of the right value. Uh, hopefully I'll hit it the first time. If not, I'll just uh, make some modifications. And then the cobalt um, is going to have some air around it as well. And I'm going to Mix up a little of this ultramarine blue, a little bit of white, and hopefully that will work. For the air around the cobalt. Okay, so I don't need a lot of this color, so I'm mixing up fairly small piles of paint. For this. So I think I'm going to take my softer brush, my uh, white sable or the synthetic sable, and I'm going to start with this darkest value for the background and uh, Start painting in some of that outer parameter of the background. So I'm just painting right up to most of these objects. Um, however, this is the darker value, so I'm, 
I'm just sort of keeping it in the outskirts of the painting right now um, because I'm going to come in with the other values here in a minute and you'll see how to handle how I'm going to handle that. Um, now I these leaves over on the left, I really want those to seem like they, they are uh, dissolving into the into the background or into the shadows. So I'm not going to be real specific about uh, you know painting all the air behind those. I want to keep that rather thin, rather vague. Uh, maybe a little mysterious in a way. I think I'll come in and, and just try to maybe draw in a little bit of the stem. See this stem. Comes in there. Okay, so I'm going to switch to the next value, lighter. And we're going to come in here with, with that. I find that painting backgrounds is probably the most difficult part of the painting. Um, for some reason, it uh, I think because you don't really want the background to be the main thing, but um, that the painting is about. But at the same time, you want it to be interesting and also an integral part of the painting. And it's it's very it can be rather ambiguous, and I think that's. Part of the difficulty is the ambiguity of it. Um, and I'm going to go to the lightest value and that's probably almost too light so I'm going to maybe mix a little bit of that in with the middle value. Bring it in around this leaf. So the idea is that I'm trying to get the uh, Hi, my name is Jeff Legg, and I'm here this morning to talk to you about still life. We're going to be painting this setup here today, and uh, hopefully I can step you through some of my thought process in uh, uh, working through this painting. Uh, so here I'm starting with some just raw umber and black and a little bit of merge medium. And uh, 
if I uh, determine that my my right side boundary where this cobalt cup, let's say it's uh, approximately right there and this grape is about right there and I come over to the left side and this rose is about here and the leaf is about there. So, so this is my, my cobalt cup and my cantaloupe. They're the, the star of the show, so to speak. So um, I'm going to go right in and just block those, those shapes in. And this leaf hangs over the table. You get this really nice shadow. And I got a couple shadows hanging over the edge of the table here. Maybe a little bit more blue and less black. Get my brush loaded right here and Take a little bit of this tabletop color and I'm just going to mix it right into the, the rose color. Okay, so we've got some leaves to do here and I'm going to take a little viridian, a little Cad yellow and um, put a little cad red deep in that and see if we can come up with a color that's about right for the uh, eucalyptus leaves. And what I really like about these leaves is they have a just a variety of color from kind of a very neutral warm green to uh, almost a reddish, reddish uh, color. I just really enjoy seeing these reflected lights. In this case, the uh, you're seeing a lot of red orange bouncing up into the underside of this. You have to kind of pick and choose what you want to uh, include. You don't need to include every stem. We'll just try this one right through here. Don't want 
going to overdo this, so I'm just going to kind of knock it down, make it, make it not quite so bright. Well, that was a classic from Jeff Legg called Cobalt and Cantaloupe, and you can learn more about it at lilyartvideo.com. Remember, there's a special discount in the comments section. Thanks for watching.